Energy drives the planet. It also drives these three inventors. You'll meet a man who makes objects float in the air, a guy who levitates UFOs in his basement, and a self-made scientist who's battled the U.S. government to bring his machine and cheap energy to the whole world. These are the new energy inventors, finding strange new ways to power the planet. What goes up must come down, right? Well, unless you've figured out a way to harness an untapped force in the universe. Enter this lab and everything you know gets tossed out the window. Welcome to the world of John Hutchison, where the improbable may just become our reality. John Hutchison has been dabbling with electricity for decades, copying the work of famed scientist Nikola Tesla, whose AC power still runs our world. Along the way, messing about with military surplus gear, John may have stumbled across one of the most amazing scientific discoveries of our age. Experimenting with radio waves and electricity led John to discover an effect which has mystified government and military scientists. It boils, it bends, it sends objects flying through the air. I was building these replications of Tesla's old machines and found them doing fascinating things. Then this whole thing happened, this fluke kind of thing, the Hutchison effect. This was some effect. Air squeezed out of bottles, ice drinks moving through space, drill bits levitating. An effect so convincing and so varied, it seemed impossible to fake. In John's labs, I've actually seen levitation of rock. I've seen levitation of steel, steel ball bearings, glass, where they will levitate. Unbelievable. I've seen electricity go right into the objects and a million pieces just fly apart. In fact, using only 75 watts of energy, enough for a small light bulb, Hutchison made a 60-pound cannonball rise off the table. It would also fuse dissimilar materials heat metal but not burn the wood it sat on, shatter metal as well as change its crystalline structure. This was something to write home about. Beginning of 1980, experimenting with all the electromagnetics and uh, electrostatic equipments I had at the time, I started to notice some very, very unusual effects such as a room being filled, filled up very quickly with multicolored lights, steel bars sitting on wood and not causing any fires, metal turning to jelly, things levitating and jumping off to the ceiling or simply go up, hover, and then fall back down. Dubbed by some as the poltergeist machine, there is no one machine, just a lot of old army surplus gear, randomly tuned by John. No one knows how it works. John has apparently figured out the right combination of radio waves and electrical energy to create the effect. If it could be proven, its impact would be huge you'd have to rewrite most of the science textbooks, especially the part about what goes up. And the story gets even weirder, involving both the Canadian and U.S. military intelligence. Here we go, into my place. Canadian government seized my laboratory, which was 22 tons of equipment. I came back from Germany and moved into this place here and started my experiments again with army surplus and navy surplus equipments which I got from actually from warships and bought a lot from various surplus stores in the United States and Canada starting in 1994 and some of this equipment actually goes back to the 1940s directional finding equipment all kinds of neat configuration of waveforms and that right up to 44 gigahertz it gives me a wide range and wide spectrum of fields and that to work with. Of course, given the potential magnitude of an effect which can turn metal into jelly and levitate objects, it wasn't long before news leaked out. In this case, to Colonel John Alexander with INSCOM, U.S. Army Intelligence. 
whose specialties included training people to bend metal with their minds, or PK, psychokinetic training. Well, they had an eight millimeter film, and it was purported to have been taken in Canada, and it showed various items that were levitating, falling, accelerating, uh, the breadth of materials that seemed to be affected by whatever the effect was, was certainly interesting, because it wasn't just metal, it clearly wasn't just some big magnet or something like that. And it was sufficiently interesting that we said, I want to learn more about that. So we agreed to fund him. Why was the Army so interested in John's effect? Well, look at all those objects going up instead of down. They knew a hot property when they saw it. This anti-gravity could have a huge impact on military aircraft. New types of propulsion in weight-reduced planes could fly higher and faster. So Colonel Alexander and his team went to Vancouver to test John's effect. During 1983, U.S. Army Intelligence and Los Alamos National Laboratories set me up in a large laboratory. We did four months of testing. We had a team of six people from Army Intelligence and from Los Alamos, including myself, that came out for the demonstration. As usual, John revved up his machines to create his electronic force field to start the effect. Exactly what happened next is still debated by the various participants. And things started off very good, actually, because there was a whole battery of lights, fluorescent lights that lit up really bright and then exploded, and then incandescent lamps in this massive warehouse lit up. The effects that happened always happened when we were not present, and so cannot give any first-hand uh, evidence. Time progressed in all these experiments. Um, we get mirrors breaking apart, um, voltage, odd voltage things happening. But Colonel Alexander had given John some metal rods he used in his psychokinetic work to test the validity of people's metal bending claims. These rods could only be bent through extreme measures, like heating them to thousands of degrees. Probably the most interesting was a molybdenum rod that I used in uh, PK testing. And what had happened is he presented to me, it had a slight S curve in the rod itself. We looked at it very carefully to see if it had been heated and gripped or something like that and found no indication uh, that it had. That suggested to us that there were effects that were going on. In the end, Bob, a skeptical Los Alamos investigator, deemed the tests inconclusive. And according to this letter from Los Alamos, all documents pertaining to the Hutchison tests were destroyed. According to Bob, the one man, things didn't work. And let's forget about it and classify it. While officially the tests were brushed aside, Colonel Alexander has kept an open mind. Even though nothing happened, during our investigation when we were present. Uh, five of the six people present believed that it probably did happen, it just didn't happen you know, while we were there. But the fact remained that the U.S. intelligence services left, apparently having written the effect off. Then on the 24th of February, 1990, something strange happened. John was out of the country when his lab was forcibly seized by the Canadian government. Despite a court order to return it, John never got his equipment back. When he tried to move his experiments to Germany, the authorities there refused him permission. Months later, John heard a rumor that his brainchild was not dead and buried, but was being studied by the American military. It was basically classified, and I've been hearing stories for years and feel now that they did get results and are replicating it at Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. Was it a rumor, or was the largest military power on the planet experimenting with the Hutchison effect? John believes the Pentagon tests of his anti-gravity effect may have ended up at Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, home to secret U.S. military projects, including new types of super aircraft and top secret or black ops propulsion systems. Stranger still, 
Nick Cook, a writer for the respected British military journal Jane's Defense Weekly, found out about John Hutchison's work through one of Lockheed Martin's top scientists. So I was at Lockheed Martin, I was with Boyd Bushman, a senior engineer there, and he showed me a film that purported to show some of John Hutchison's levitation experiments. What we saw was a saw, some nails, a hammer, you know, household stuff. Most of them were shooting off the top of the screen. It was almost like an impulse reaction. Normally, I would have kind of looked at this stuff and just thought it's somebody idea, somebody's idea of a practical joke. But the fact that it was being highlighted to me by somebody, of, somebody from Lockheed Martin as something I should be paying attention to kind of got my attention. And that was what really convinced me to go and at least have a look at what John, John Hutchison was doing. I'm 99% convinced that this is not a hoax. I don't think anyone knows what is going on here, but too many people have looked into it, too many people have investigated. You know, people who have my respect for me to think that it's a hoax. Eventually, Lockheed Martin would send their own team to conduct tests. But John hasn't heard much since, and he worries about his technology being used for military purposes. Like Galileo in his time, who was imprisoned for looking too closely at stars, John and his technology have been stopped cold, shunned by mainstream science. Frustrated by his inability to bring this anti-gravity technology to the world, John spends his days gathering more Navy surplus gear for his much smaller apartment-based lab. Oh, cool. Better try it to make sure it works. Looks kind of great. Looks cool. For those prone to claustrophobia, John's home is not the place to stay for drinks and a game of cards. Living here in this space is like living inside a very cramped submarine. My girlfriends find this rather interesting and quite different. And actually I had some girlfriends stay overnight. They didn't seem to mind it. It hasn't got the best of things for feminine amenities, but they managed to tough it out, let's say. So what I have is this thing is on a string. It's a toy UFO. I'm going to suspend it uh, from a string off the floor, firing energy fields at it and see if I can get it to even move. Working on his effects research, John sees himself as more of an artist than scientist. Turning and twisting knobs like a painter. Dipping into electrical fields to access a random force field. But in this small lab, it's even less predictable than before. The saucer is moving and changing direction, but there might be other forces at work here. Colonel Alexander, who trained people in the U.S. Army Intelligence Service to bend metal using their minds, believes that John could be inadvertently creating the Hutchison effect through his own PK, or psychokinetic powers. One of the possibilities is that the electronic fields were actually amplifying some sort of PK experience that he was having or causing to happen. It is not uncommon if you study the whole field of poltergeist phenomena that strange macro PK events occur and yet seem to be beyond the control of the individual who is causing it to happen. An example of this kind of random event happened in 1989 when a visiting Vancouver news crew was setting up at John's lab to film the Hutchison effect. The target area was that yellow crate with the metal objects. But to everyone's shock, a sponge in the back of the room took off into the air and then fell back down. John didn't actually see it and was genuinely surprised. Like that, it went up and hit the ceiling one second, maybe two seconds, and then came down. Kind of kidding. No. Well, some time ago I was doing some testing and got into some big trouble after I levitated a toy UFO and some other objects. Apparently, John's experiments were lifting objects in nearby homes, and the neighbors called the police. The police came full bore in here with engineers, inspectors, 
they photographed all the equipments very carefully. It's almost like if you called in a cleaning cleaning crew. They didn't touch anything. It's like they made everything look neater for some strange reason. It seems like someone in the shadows still cares what our hero is up to. Frustrated by authorities and lack of recognition, John has been spending time developing his new project, batteries that last forever, based on the somewhat bizarre zero-point energy theory. Followers of this theory believe that all physical matter floats in a sea of energy, which if collected and converted into electrical power, could more than meet all the world's demand for energy. I feel everything has a life force to it, because I tend to visualize that atoms are a whole universe, and when they're combining one atom to make millions, if not trillions of them, you have a piece of metal, perhaps. Every time you run your hand across a piece of metal, you're taking off several million atoms at a time. To demonstrate how energy is everywhere, John uses rocks from his neighborhood and in two hours makes a zero-point battery strong enough to power a pen light. I make sure it bonds. Almost one half electron volt. This is better than a conventional battery simply because it never runs down. So with these things, they could last approximately as long as minerals last, up to maybe a thousand years, unknown. Realizing his batteries could help solve the world's energy crisis, the Japanese have embraced John and funded him to build his bigger crystal-based models. I got orders from Japan and sponsorship for me to make more of them. So the money would come through into my bank account, and indeed I made units that are actually in Hiroshima City. While various zero-point energy devices were funded by the Japanese, so far, none have taken off on a mass scale. John Hutchison is probably the very visual proponent of the whole kind of zero-point energy movement. Zero-point energy devices could revolutionize the planet. If you can build a zero-point energy reactor about the size of your microwave oven, put it in the back of your house somewhere, you run your house. You don't need to you run all its electricity needs. You don't need to pull anything off the national grid. Well, if you put that into the third world, you're going to revolutionize the third world. That is as much a threat to some people as it is a benefit. And as far as the Hutchison effect goes, I'm rather disturbed that the U.S. government and aerospace corporations has it. The concerns of it being used for an evil force by the military-industrial complex disturbs me quite a bit. I like to see it used for the helping of nature because uh, there's so much pollution going on with nature. Mankind tends to want to fight each other all the time with wars, whereas Mother Nature rolls on with great energy and power. It's absolutely essential for the world and survival of the world that we get off petrochemicals. Uh, failure to do so it really threatens our national survival. What I like about John is that he doesn't compromise. He doesn't compromise his appearance. He doesn't compromise his lifestyle. What he does is pretty unconventional. So, um, you know, good on him. I, I'm, I'm all for that, and uh, I wouldn't want him to change. He's fine just the way he is. Whether building batteries or levitating objects, John Hutchison is an eccentric enigma. Of course, virtually no mainstream scientists take John or his invention seriously. But then, only a little over a hundred years ago, people believed it was impossible to send a radio wave across the Atlantic. Now, just imagine if this backyard scientist really has discovered a primal force of nature that could transform our world. I am only taken seriously by the military scientists. The academic scientists really don't know what to make of me. Well, to say a lot of other people too don't know what to make of me. I'm just a different person and I'm kind of happy with myself. I don't want to try and change myself.
It's been almost 80 years since a little-known scientist found a new way to make things fly. He called it anti-gravity. It didn't exactly catch on, although since then, science fiction artists have had a field day. But now, Tim Ventura is one of a worldwide army of garage tinkerers trying to prove the idea was just way ahead of its time and that anti-gravity lifters are set to pay off big time. Tim Ventura is not your average computer nerd. Yes, he's president of the American Anti-Gravity website, but beyond that, he's a pioneer, a basement scientist who, along with his French counterpart, is spearheading the lifter movement to bring this little-known anti-gravity effect to as many people as possible. I got involved with researching anti-gravity devices in 1992, and I started working with a, a gentleman named Bill Butler, who had a company called HoverTech in Florida. HoverTech was basically investigating just kind of a levitation approach. They didn't want to actually take off, they just wanted to hover, kind of like in uh, the movie Back to the Future 2. It drew me in deeper. It's one of those things where once it sparks your imagination, you just get more and more involved, and once you start doing this research on your own, there's really no limit to where you can go with it. Even after close to a century, just what makes lifters lift is not well understood. But there's no denying they're cool, so it's strange that they've never caught on with the public. In the 1920s, a mysterious scientist named Thomas Townsend Brown discovered that he could create artificial gravity using high voltage charges. In time, his work was picked up by the military, and some even speculate he worked on the bizarre 1940s Philadelphia experiment, an attempt to cloak a Navy ship using an electrical field. To this day, conspiracy theorists claim the ship was zapped into a time warp, vanished and reappeared miles away, with the crew transformed into the metal walls of the ship. By comparison, Tim's life has been quite mundane, although using lifter technology is not without its challenges. Well, the lifter technology requires a high voltage air gap, and this Cockroft Walton voltage multiplier essentially provides 50,000 volts of energy for the lifter to, to be powered from. 50,000 volts, as much as some high power transmission lines, run along thin wires and electrify the aluminum foil to create lift effect. The shape makes the lifter strong, and black threads prevent it from taking off too high. A few people had written back and said, well, you guys are holding it up with thread. It's obvious from looking at it. I almost found that really humorous because we're not holding it up with thread. We're holding it down with thread. The tethers are there because we have an off-board power supply. The power supply is usually two to three feet off to the left or right. The reason being, the power supply is just too heavy. The lifter's not efficient enough to lift it. So it all comes down to finding a portable power source. That's the main hurdle to creating aircraft-sized lifters that could one day reach space shuttle speeds of 15,000 miles an hour. And as Tim knows all too well, there's always a few skeptics. When I was doing this in college, when I was experimenting with these things back then, a lot of people did think it was rather silly. There was kind of a stigma associated with it, not just for myself, but a lot of the other experimenters that were working with this stuff. It was early 1990s, the height of the youth music scene in Seattle, and Tim's fellow students seemed too, well, busy to have time to share his vision of the future. But things have changed to the point now where when people kind of get an idea of the stuff that we're working with, um, they're, they're really impressed. But what exactly makes the lifter lift? There's a lot of debate surrounding the lifter and how it works precisely. I believe that there are two effects involved. Well, ion wind is definitely a component, and the ions actually are only traveling from the wire to the foil, but they're moving enough air with them as they travel to actually create a net aerodynamic effect. So the wind that you're feeling is actually just from air moving. Ion wind, visible on this flag, is part of the story. The other is scientist T.T. Brown's anti-gravity effect which remains somewhat of a mystery. It's not explicable by the known laws of science or physics. 
There are those who say that this is that levitation, uh, lift to levitation, is being generated by something called ion wind. Um, there are those who say that it is a strict, pure anti-gravitic effect. Actually, as someone who reports on aerospace matters, I don't much care what it is. The fact is, it's generating lift, and it's generating lift in a way that we can't readily explain. The devices can be engineered into something useful. I think we should investigate it. Let's engineer it into something workable. How about an interstellar spacecraft? Well, something along those lines is being suggested by French scientist Jean-Louis Naudin, the self-proclaimed godfather of lifters and Tim's biggest influence. Basement scientists like Tim all over the world are surfing into Jean-Louis's website to get the latest lifter design tips. Now, Dan opened that up on the internet. He published plans, the first set of plans on the internet for how to replicate the effect. Nodin and his disciples, like Tim, are promoting the idea of an internet community of lifter builders worldwide. They want this new form of electric propulsion to be developed, despite resistance from a skeptical scientific community who can't see past the balsa wood and foil. Pushing the lifter envelope, Nodin recently announced the successful launch of Orville, the world's first mouse electronaut. One small step for mouse kind, maybe, but for humans? I'd be lying if I said there wasn't a dangerous component to it. It works with high voltages. So in that regard, it might be somewhat similar to a stun gun, although depending on how large the power supply is and how large the lifter is, it could pack considerably more punch. From amateur experiments to mouse transportation, it seems lifters may be destined to stay in the basement, and yet they may also have a dark side. Some believe lifter anti-gravity technology is being used to reduce the weight of aircraft, like the B-2 bomber, or as suggested by the Philadelphia experiment, to create a cloaking or stealth effect. If you can generate a stealth effect by um, covering an airframe or a ship for that matter with an electrostatic field, a relatively simple method of developing a stealth effect, then that's a secret that's worth protecting. So there are spin-offs to this whole kind of electrogravitic area in terms of what you do with electricity that do tap fairly heavily into the military field. What I like about Tim Ventura and his organization, his website, AmericanAntigravity.com, is that he's publicizing something which I think should be getting publicity. You know, for years, anti-gravity has been equated with kind of UFOs, space aliens, kind of way out there subject material. Actually, it's a serious scientific endeavor, and it should be given serious consideration. So we need to pursue this, the kind of out-of-the-box thinking that guys like Tim Ventura publicize on their websites. So I think what he's doing is, is a good job. Congress has recently decided to put major funding into the study of lifter technology. Although he's seeing none of that money, Tim is encouraged that Thomas Townsend Brown's ideas are at last getting the recognition they deserve. A science fiction propulsion system whose time has come. So hopefully within our lifetimes, either the lifter or some other form of anti-gravity technology will become an alternative to aircraft and possibly even to automobiles. And if it does, I'd like to be part of that industry. I can turn deserts into oases. I've always said this technology will do more to bring world peace than all the kings and queens and politicians have ever lived. And I still know, without any doubt in my mind, this technology is a means for me to accomplish the vow I made standing on the mountain as a young man in Puerto Rico. Joe Newman just turned 67 years old, and he's still pressing 900 pounds with his legs. Raised in the country, he's a self-made inventor who's been struggling for most of his life to get people to embrace his brainchild. A machine that can power the planet for free. He's written presidents, been on national television, met with scientists, held national press conferences, and taken on the U.S. Patent Office. Despite every hurdle, Joe's determination is inexhaustible and he's still convinced his free energy machine is set to revolutionize the world. Always, I've had a great curiosity. 
My grandmother used to spank me saying I had the devil in me because I'd tear up toys to see what made them work. She thought I was just plain mean. Because <laughs> anything I'd get, I'd tear it up and I'd tear up my brother's toys. I was curious as to why they worked and how they worked. And the problem was I'd had trouble a lot of times to put them back together because I didn't have any tools. <laughs> so it didn't <laughs> work too well with the adults. Joe's dream is for every house in America to be running his energy machine, a device that uses a small burst of power to start up, then stores and multiplies that power, enough to run your house or car, plus some juice left over. Such a machine defies all known laws of science, which say you can't get something for nothing. Sounds like perpetual motion. But Joe's machine uses power normally wasted in electric motors. Despite backing from mathematicians, physicists, and mechanical engineers, the U.S. Patent Office stubbornly refuses to take Joe seriously. Undeterred, he soldiers on. The origin of Joe's discovery dates back to 1957, when he was stationed in Puerto Rico on an army base. I just saw a lot of disparity between wealth and poverty. And I was in an orphanage home myself when I was a kid, and I feel compassion for people. I saw 200 people get wiped out on an Indian island in a hurricane. They had it on the news one day like it was 200 pigs. And that really upset me. And so I stood on a mountain one night talking to God and looking up into a beautiful night of stars, billions of stars. And I made a vow that this, I'm the only entity in the universe. I'm going to make an effort to do good, do good for humanity. And I prefer death than not do it. Give me the wisdom. Give me the knowledge that I can accomplish what I wish to accomplish before I die. I'll never see this disparity of wealth and poverty anywhere on earth or the injustice that I see here. I have lived that vow. But Joe was a young inventor, not a scientist. He patented some of the first plastic covered barbells in America. And then one day he came across a book on electrical energy that gave him new insights into how the universe worked. In 1968, God had me go through a series of thoughts and I saw it. It's a gyroscopic particle, and I knew that it was right, and I knew it could be beneficial to mankind. Gyroscopes, like this child's toy, stabilize as they spin on their axis. In examining the way magnets attract and repel, Joe came up with nothing less than a working model for the universe that turned scientific theory of the last 200 years on its ear. He believes all atomic particles are actually tiny gyroscopes. Always staying level, they move in endless spirals, attracting and colliding with each other. And it's that theory that drives his machine. Today, Joe is giving a demonstration of that gyro energy with his machine running a big fan using a very small amount of power. According to the manual, this fan needs several horsepower to run it. But connected to Joe's energy machine, it's drawing only a few milliamps from this array of nearly spent 9-volt batteries, the kind you use in smoke alarms. In fact, there's such little power getting through that it won't even run this tiny toy motor, which works when tested with a fresh 9-volt. And you can hear it. So Joe's machine is somehow taking a trickle of power, spinning it through the machine's copper coils to create a power output 30 times greater than what went in enough to turn the big fan. And that's not supposed to happen. So if this is true, then Joe's machines could be used all over the world, powering energy-starved third world countries with just a few leftover batteries. But as amazing as the device is, it's the theory behind it that's become the main purpose of Joe's life. This technology is gonna be an industrial revolution all over again, because everything from fertilizer steel is tied to the cost of energy, so that means all the products will come out and the public buying it will cost them a lot less money. Joe's never set himself an easy task. And from the moment he started this energy work, he's wanted to change the world. Joe wants to bring Newman power to the people of the planet. 25 years ago, a patent attorney suggested that for Joe to prove his radical ideas about energy, he'd have to build a working energy machine. For the next two decades, he had to try to convince the world that it worked. Now instantly, that told me that the magnetic field was not relative. One of the first who took notice was mechanical engineer and alternative energy expert, Milton Everett, who worked with the Mississippi Department of Energy. 
he's honest. When I first went down there, I went down as a total skeptic. You know, I said, this guy's, you know, there's got to be something wrong. Either he's a charlatan or a con artist or trying to trick somebody or whatever. And he told me right up front, he said, I came down here to shoot you down. I said, great. I said, do it. I said, let me just show you. I want you to listen to my theory. Now, he was a mechanical engineer, and he listened to what I had to say. It all made sense to Milton the first time he heard it, because he's mechanical. He said, Joe, I just think that's beautiful, what you just told me. And over a period of time, uh, with what I saw and with, with what the engineers from Mississippi State saw, you know, I became convinced. Um, I'm sure a lot of y'all come here totally unbelieving. That's okay. Um, history always repeats itself. Joe said, well, what do you think, Milton? And I said, Joe, I, I truly think you've got something here that is going to change the world. And then he asked me the tough question. He said, will you stand up with me and tell the world this? And that was, that was a gut wrencher. And so I had to reach down in my guts and say, you got the courage to stand up and say what, the, what this is. And I, and I told him, yes, I do. I'll, I'll, I'll stand up with you. His machine is probably the most important invention and discovery in the history of man. As a result of Milton, then I got other people involved. I gave a demonstration at the Hilton in New Orleans. You know, A. E. Albert was there. A whole bunch of scientists was there speaking, and it was packed with people, 1,500 people in there. The fire marshal had came in because it was so many people. He wouldn't let nobody else in. To a man who needs no introduction, Joseph Newman. Well, I've worked with Joe now. This is actually my 20th year. I became fascinated by his work and what he was proposing, so I went to hear him at Tulane University. At that time, knew a number of scientists, chemists, electrical engineers, physicists, and I got all of these gentlemen together and drove them literally to Joe Newman's workshop in Mississippi at the time. All of them spent the better part of a day with Joe, uh, looking at his prototypes, testing his various prototypes extensively, and all of them, to a person, signed affidavits attesting to the validity of his work. Throughout the early 80s, despite the affidavits, the U.S. Patent Office sat on Joe's application to register his invention. Eventually, it was turned down on the basis that it was a perpetual motion machine, something deemed impossible. It's not a perpetual motion machine because there is a lot of power generated internally called back EMF, but he figured out a way to use it so that it would add to the power coming out rather than detract from the power. In some sense, I think it may have been a cover-up for what they really knew that it was, and they wanted to keep it out of the public commercial application. So Joe may be the first person to harness this usually wasted energy, but that didn't help him with his patent battle. I think the patent office acted uh, erroneously here. In fact, outrageously erroneously. Uh, I have worked with every commissioner of patents since I have been in Washington. And I'm saying that in the small minority of cases, the patent office procedure is wrong. The only comment that the patent office made was the judge should refrain from believing in the tooth fairy. Now that's no kind of credible evidence. When I had over 40 scientists who had endorsed and signed affidavits that this invention worked, I did that in good faith. And my government betrayed it and tried to say that me and all of them were conspirators or incompetent. That was their comments they made about these people. Frustrated, Joe sued the patent office. If he didn't get the patent, no one would fund him to start production. In 1986, a congressional hearing was held, which included former astronaut Senator John Glenn. Things dragged on until the late 1980s, when a judge finally ordered the National Bureau of Standards to test the energy machine. But the testing went badly and Joe remained convinced that the board was determined to see the machine stopped. Why don't you tell us when your tests are going to be ready to run? He wants to know where the output is. So we we have answered test. this in writing. You apparently have chosen 
Later, it was discovered that during their testing, the National Bureau technicians had grounded the device, invalidating the results. It seemed like Joe's amazing energy machine was destined never to see the light of day. Today, Joe holds several foreign patents, but still no U.S. patent, something he needs to generate large amounts of capital to put his machine into full-scale production. And because he doesn't want the technology buried by energy companies, Joe's been picky about who gets control of his machine. He once turned down an offer for over $200 million because the Canadian investors couldn't guarantee they'd sell the machine to the public at a fair market price. Now he spends his time traveling from shopping malls to clubs, trying to convince people of its importance, along the way resisting the odd challenge. This is not showing me well, that you... the power over there exceeds the power here. See, I, I challenge you. Let's see you go get this fan blade. Let me see you run it at 100 revolutions a minute, and let me see you do it on the amount of wattage that you see right here. Now that's current, and if you can't, if you can't add that up, you're not intelligent at all. That's going to... Joe never stops trying to get the message to the people. He's appeared in Life magazine and on The Johnny Carson Show. And now he's brought a 7,500 pound machine to this amusement park to get people talking about this bigger, better Newman machine, which he claims will run a home on just a few batteries. This will be the industrial revolution all over again, except at a greatly accelerated rate. And this big machine I have built, it'll do all the talking for me. I've talked and talked and talked and the world hasn't listened. And I'm fighting for them. They're going to come down here where Edison and Ford lived. And they were people who made a great contribution to humanity. And it's kind of appropriate that God has brought me down here to this very spot. We would like everyone at the Shell Factory to come over to Captain Fishbones on the patio to watch Joe Newman demonstrate his new energy machine. Okay, uh, appreciate you people coming to see this. I know y'all are busy looking at what you're looking at, but I want you to go back and tell your friends on this. Now, we're going to be giving another demonstration in your future running a house for this technology, and it'll produce more energy than what you put in it. Now, the U.S. government has been fighting this because they don't want y'all to have it. And it goes all the way back to Reagan and Bush, who fought me tooth and nail to keep this. And I was written up in Life magazine, September 1986. It's David against Goliath. Um, anybody know how to read an amp meter? Okay, this is a 50 amp meter. You can see where your 10, your 5 is, and you know everyone knows the mark is 1. And as you can see, we've got 10 12 volt batteries there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And you know these are 12 volt batteries, got 12 volts. Now you will see on a half of a turn, we'll run this up close to 1,000 volts on one half of a turn from the back spike of this system, which is totally impossible by conventional technology. With that, I'll touch this and y'all can see it for yourself. While the theories are sometimes tough to get your head around, Joe's hoping his demonstration of turning 120 volts into more than 1,000 volts should convince people that with his technology, 10 car batteries can provide the power needs of your average house. And according to Joe, it'll keep this up for years. All right, what's that show? 2.3. 2.3? Okay, that's 2,300 volts on that one back spike. Now that's totally impossible by conventional technology. And the U.S. government has fought this because they don't want you, the people, to have it. Now, I want you to tell everybody else that you know, they don't want you, the people, to have this technology. Now, I've given my life for y'all. I want y'all to spread the word of what you've seen. Well, from what I've seen here today, it's everything he said from what I could understand and what he was doing makes sense. It definitely sounds good to me. If it's gonna save me money, it's gonna save everyone money. The theory is a million times more important than just this technology. This is one thing, but it's as basic as the will. We will travel to other planets. We'll be able to go there and not pollute that planet. We can go there and form any element that we need from electromagnetic fields. We don't have to try to mine the ground, mess up anything. We can take the gyroscopic particles, turn it into any element that we wish to do. I know that I'm right. I know that the theory is right, and I know that God has given me all that knowledge, and I'd like to end it on that note.